it's time. So I'm hoping you're here to talk about why your company needs an internal API and what you should do about it. If you're not here to talk about that, you've missed your room. <laughs> so <laughs> you have about 30 seconds to reach the other room before they finish their introduction. So I'm Glenn. Nice to meet you all. I'll be spending the next five, 50 minutes talking about this exact problem. If you want to talk to me about it afterwards, you can reach me on Twitter or email. Please do. I love people interacting with that. Right after the talk, I'm going to be moving out as fast as I can. So Layla, who's after me, can come and set up her stuff. But I'm going to be just outside here, down the little ramp, if anyone wants to chat with me and talk about what we talked about here or anything else. I'll also be at the party tonight, and I'll be here all day tomorrow if you want to chat. Right. So I'm here to talk about a problem that I've seen many, many times in the last 20 or so years as a consultant. Um, there's been several different companies, several different sizes. It's not unique to any business or anything. It is the back end. And we're not talking about your web API, which you're making. I'm talking about the business backend that you have to interact with sometimes. In most non-trivial companies, there's got to be a bunch of those backend services that run different parts of the company. There's accounting, there's payroll, there's ERP, there's CRM, there's this, there's that. There's some domain-specific ones. And for some reason, they're often German. How many has worked with German backend massive systems ever? There's a couple of you. You have my sympathies. <laughs> How many of you were dependent on that one person to fix your access or data or something? Because <laughs> that's the problem with these systems. They're really hard to get data in and out of. Not only because, well, sometimes it's because they have custom SDKs, they have your option is to integrate with the database. I was at one business once, and they had all their data. All their uh, consultant CVs was in this one system. And so, OK, how can we integrate with that? How can we get that data out? Oh, it's easy, said the vendor. You can export everyone to Word files. Right. <laughs> and that was it. That was literally it. It was a one-way street of data into that system. They have proprietary APIs, they have old technology. And even if you get past that, you're often dependent on Bob, let's call him that, who is the gatekeeper of said system. And also, if you have a system that's running a multi-million dollar enterprise, you don't really want people just shoving things in and out of it willy-nilly. You want some kind of control. So it, that makes sense, but it makes our life hard. Let's take a simple example and describe the problem. You have an ERP system, enterprise resource planning, CRM system with customers in it, and an e-commerce system. This is not an uncommon situation. This is simple. We have three systems. And you have a sales team. And your sales team wants an app where they can show some customer history, some customer information, what have they been ordering, and so far. So, all of these systems have different interfaces. So you make your sales system and have different parts in it. We do proper code, so we split it up in different contexts in the code. And we talk to these various systems. And some data are here, and some data are there. Some data split. For instance, the customer view needs data from both of these things. The order data needs from here and there, and it works out. And the project is a tremendous success. You made a web app, everybody's happy, you delivered on time. These integrations took some time, but you budgeted for that, so that was OK. Everybody's happy. In fact, the sales team is so pleased, they want a mobile app to go with it. Most of the same data, but slightly different. They want different contexts and stuff like that. But you find there's very little to be reused. All the integrations you made have to be remade. You can copy and paste some, but now you have it both places. 
And there's constraints, there's budget, there's consultants hired in with no long-term thinking, shortcuts have been made, and over time this becomes very, very difficult to work with and to change. And as we know, the only constant thing in our business is change. So when something is hard to change, it's not a desirable situation. And these are the kind of situations that make Mr. Newman sad. This is the picture of the world's saddest dog. He's actually named Mr. Newman, and he is the world's saddest dog. Now, that was just two systems. Imagine you have a bunch more of those apps and a bunch more of those backend services, and Mr. Newman is never going to be happy. So let's step back a little bit and look at the bigger picture. What do companies want? Except money. <laughs> Well, if you take away money, they usually want the things that make them more money faster. And this usually boils down to three things. They want innovation. They want to figure out stuff that the competition hasn't figured out. They want new services, new things, new ways of making money that someone else hasn't thought about. The old saying, if you're standing still, you're falling behind because everybody else is moving forward. They want to be agile. They want to respond to change. When something happens, OK, we need to shift. There's things going on in our business. This thing's going on here. This thing's going on here. We need to respond to that and be able to move in different directions. New opportunities. You know the old saying, embrace change, right? It's really hard to embrace change when you're dealing with a three-letter German. And they want speed. They want time to market. The business wants to say what they want, and they want to try it next week, which is even harder because Bob's on vacation. But nothing's happening in that part of the world. So these things are sometimes really hard to get. What we need to do is build this capability in a different lane than our backend system. We need to make two lanes. So we can't, we can't have those things on the massive, all-compassing backend services in our company. Because you don't really want to change your ERP system every other day. You don't want to have new releases and upgrades of your ERP system every week. You don't, have to, don't want to run an ITIL process for everything you do in your company. And there's good reasons why you don't want to do that. <laughs> there's good reasons why these systems should be slow and resistant to change. But there's also good reasons why we should have a place in the business for those things that should not be slow. So we need a slow lane for stability and a fast lane for innovation experimentation. What we need is something between these two things that make that transition smooth and make the data flow nicely across. And this is where API comes in and wins the day. Now, don't just take my word for it. I have stats. Of course, 89% of the statistics on the internet are made up. But still, these are studies. Uh, they're made by MuleSoft. So you can actually read the case studies and look them up. Siemens increased product delivery speed by 50%, cut the time to deliver new minimum valuable products by 50%. BP increased their development with two times by introducing a company API, a fast lane and a slow lane. Now, developing at twice the speed, you're basically cutting your development cost in half or you're getting twice as much value for the same input. That is a significant impact. So how do we do this? Well, well, we have to start from the bottom and work our way up. The basic problem is that all of our backend services have their own language. And every time you want to talk to it, someone has to learn that language, that way of communicating. 
And that knowledge doesn't translate into the next service because that is a different language and a different setup. <coughs> and as in the story of the Tower of Babel, that makes it really hard to communicate properly. Now, last night, I was hanging out with some friends from the conference, and we were people from Norway, from Sweden, from Netherlands. I think there was a Danish guy there, UK, US, Israel, and we could all communicate happily because we all spoke English. We had a common language. So that's what we need. We need a common language to define the way we speak to each other and not a programming language. This is not, we'll write all our services in C-sharp and everyone will be happy. <laughs> that doesn't work. Although the world would be a happier place if everyone was Norwegian, but still. And here's where Open API comes in. It is a description format for HTTP-based APIs. Don't worry if you can't read it, I'll zoom into the interesting parts. This used to be called Swagger. Anyone heard of Swagger? Yeah, cool. Anyone ever used Swagger or OpenAPI? Ah, oh, nice. You describe your API, your endpoints, your operation response and everything, the lot. And the important part of it is that this is machine readable. I can take my open API specification file, give it to a machine who can then make sense of it. Who's old enough to remember WSDL files? Uh, a couple of you as well. It's basically the same thing, just less angle brackets and more significant white space, which can die in a dumpster fire for all, all I'm concerned. But you can have, yeah, but I prefer the JSON. Right, I'm not a big fan of significant white space. So let's take a little close look at it. We define our user's endpoint, has a get operation, returns a 200 OK, that's good. And if you do that, then you'll get an array of strings. There's a lot more to this, but that's the basic premise of it. You define your endpoints, what operations you can do, what responses can you expect, and in what shape should those responses be? Given this, I can take my open API and start generating clients. I can automatically consume it from multiple tools, multiple languages. I can generate client in multiple languages. I can have, we for instance have one API that is client generated in TypeScript and one in C Sharp from the same file. Visual Studio has a connected client built in for open API files. .NET Core has support for generating clients in the build process. All this is nice, but the actual generation of clients is not that interesting in this context. What is interesting is how we can generate an open API file from a service. The details are different in various frameworks and various languages, but you usually have three ways of generating clients or working with this. Not generating clients, but generating your open API files. One is defining in code in your service that I should generate an open API file. If you're running ASP.NET Core, you add Swagger Gen with some parameters. What's the title of your API and so on and so. And then you say, use Swagger. That's all you need to do. That will generate Swagger data, and it will generate an endpoint where someone can go and read that JSON file. If you want, you can add this part of here, use Swagger UI, which will give you a nice UI where you can go and explore your API. So I take my existing service, I add a few lines of code, and I add what's called Swashbuckle, which is a NuGet package that does this, and it will generate this file for me. Another option is taking your compiled DLL and using software to look at that and generate your open API spec. So you don't have to change this code at all. As long as it is, for instance, if you're using NSWAG, which is a software you can use to do this with, it will look at framework DLLs, web APIs, and .NET Core web APIs. 
It will find your controllers, it will look at the return types, and it will generate clients or generate a spec for you. The third option is artisan open API. You handcraft this, and there's a bunch of services and tools that will help you do that in an effective fashion. And based on that file, you generate your service layer. And then you fill in the actual code. There's pluses and minuses with both. We're not going to go hugely into these, but go look at the Microsoft Docs page. You can go to tinyurl.net open API, and it will take you to the Microsoft Docs page, or you can just Google NSWAG and Swashbuckle on Microsoft Docs, and you'll find it. It has a bunch of details on how you generate open API files in your software. So what we want to do is want to take our three services and build an open API layer on top of these services. These are basically CRUD proxies, pretty much. We can make small services. Some people like to call these microservices as a loaded term that doesn't really relate here, but it could be. But we can have various tools to, to create these ones. Depending on your system, you can even get away with making no code. Anyone heard of Azure Logic Apps? Show of hands? A few? OK. For those who haven't, it's a workflow kind of sort of like if the, this, then that. So here's an example where you can have when an HTTP request is received, send messages to SAP. And here's the beauty of Logic Apps. It has literally hundreds of connectors to various systems that you have never heard of. <laughs> and it has, a, depending on who you are, it will have a few connectors that you have heard of, and you're thinking, oh, yeah, I want that. Where with the SAP connector, you add some parameters on what table, certificates, et cetera, et cetera, just configuration, and it can send a message to SAP. There's ones for pulling data out. There's connectors to Salesforce. There's connectors to I different IBM systems. You name it, there's probably a connector for it. So from all the way from no code, just dragging and dropping boxes, literally, it will generate open API spec for you. It will do that automatically. To Logic Apps, we can make a simple web app in Azure. We can use Azure Functions. If you want and are so inclined, you can build the Kubernetes clusters and host these things on. It doesn't matter. You can have it on a VM. If you have one of these old systems that the client has to have installed some kind of ancient COM library to be able to talk to this thing, or you need this specific version of the Oracle database driver or whatever. Anybody had that pain? That's a fun place to be. It doesn't really matter because on top of all of these, you'll build an open API spec, which makes this machine readable and consumable. So anything that's able to talk to your backend system and respond to HTTP requests, that's all you need. So now we have these open API things on top here. Now, you don't want to eat the whole elephant at once. You don't want to go to your ERP system and say, right, what's all the data we have here? I'm going to make a proxy that exposes all of that data. That is, anyone doing lean and stuff like that? No. If you're doing lean, that's called generating waste. At best, it's called generating inventory. You're making stuff, putting it on the shelf in your warehouse in case someone needs it. Spoiler alert, they're not going to need it. So you build what you need, right? You do not sit down with your SAP system and build the whole thing. You figure out, OK, we're going to need some information about our customers because we want to build this thing for our sales team, right? So OK, we'll make the customer service here. We'll have a service here that exposes 
the customers from the ERP system. And then we'll make a little service that exposes the customers from the CRM system. What did that give us? Well, now we have two surfaces that are easily consumable via HTTP and an open standardized interface. So now I can build my customer service on top here that gathers data from both of these and collects it to a unified customer view in my company. Now, anyone needing to know something about a customer can know, now ask this one. And they do not have to know where that comes from. Is it an ERP thing? Is it a CRM thing? I don't care. I'll just pull it from the customer service. And these are relatively simple services, right? They don't do much. There's a little bit of logic in the customer here and what goes where and stuff like that. And my orders, I can build an orders thing on top of that. Now, all of these have an open API service on top, so they can be consumed and they can be reused. So I'll build an older history thing on top here, which needs some customer data, which you can now get from here, from the customer service. It doesn't have to bother with the ERP or the CRM system. And I can build my web API on top here to serve my React front end for the sales team. And then, oh, well, we have the mobile app as well. And with mobile, you have some other, we didn't, since Rachel was sick, we didn't get to see her GraphQL talk. So we don't have a GraphQL interface. So we had to decide what kind of data we want. So mobile has different constraints. Maybe we don't want as much data, maybe we want less data, maybe we want some different data. So we'll make a mobile API. But we can consume the parts we want from the customer and the order history services, which is super, super easy. It's a matter of generating a client based on open API, open API spec, and then just doing get customer. So it opens up for a whole new world of code and logic reuse. Now, there's a semblance of layers here, which is not entirely unintentional. At the bottom, we have our data layer. This is basically our databases, right? Here's our repositories and persistence layer, ERP customers. The responsibility here is to store or retrieve data. In this layer, you're going to need insight and understanding of the underlying layer, but only in a vertical. So someone making this service needs to understand this backend system, but not the other ones on a technical level. So here's our company business logic, our business layer. Here you'll need knowledge about the actual business. You'll need to know what comes from where, but not necessarily how it comes from there. Right? So you need to understand when you work in that layer, what part of a customer is from the ERP system and what comes from the CRM system. But you don't have to know how to talk to SAP, for instance. You don't have to know how to talk to a Dynamics system or maybe as a, an M3 system or whatever. You can just consume this data. You need to know what data is where, and you need to know the logic of the business. What does it mean with the customer and so on and so forth. And on the top, it's our presentation layer. You can combine several sources into specialized views for a particular app. Often done on a client by client basis. And I think it's really helpful to think of an API in these layers because they have different characteristics. Velocity and agility increases as you go up the stack. So on the top here is where you can innovate and experiment. You can change things around. You can say, OK, well, someone can say, what if we had a mobile app that did this? And people go, OK, that's cool. Let's try it. And has anyone heard of Power Apps? Yeah. 
Power Apps is a no-code solution for Microsoft to make apps. They look like mobile apps, not really a mobile app, they're a shell inside a mobile app, but for all intents and purposes, a mobile and desktop app. They can consume open API services directly. You can just add them. And any power user, business analyst with a little bit of training and intelligence can make an app consuming and combining data. Why would you want them to do that? Because you want to experiment. Because it is really, really fast and cheap. So we can have different levels of agility in our organization. Now, this also needs to, leads to another thing, which a lot of people value, which is autonomous teams. In order to have an autonomous team, you need to have responsibility and capability to solve your problem. So you get a challenge. Can you fix this? Can you make something that does this? And they go, yeah, we can do that. And that team should be able to solve that problem on their own. And an autonomous team is not autonomous if everything they do depends on Bob. But now it doesn't anymore. Bob's working here with these guys. Autonomous teams are working further up, seeing what services are available in the company and saying, okay, how can we combine this data in new interesting ways? Now, this, of course, looks rather complicated, even if all of these boxes have the same surface. And if we have all of these things as complete individual parts, it is kind of complicated. The next move is to make this into a unified surface. And for this, we use something that's called API management. API management is a technique. And someone has unfortunately decided to make products who have the same names as techniques, which makes it kind of confusing. <laughs> but API management is when you use a tool or a service that will help you do many of the things we just talked about. Depending on your backend systems, it can connect to them directly. It can pull data out and push data in even. It can translate from one standard to another. It can translate from, so from SOAP to REST, for instance, or REST-ish. You can take multiple APIs and combine them into one unified surface. And you can do different things with the data as it comes in and goes. You can change it, you can manipulate it, and you can add things like authorization and authentication on the edge. So you can make sure anyone calling into these services are authenticated, and that's some one less thing to care about further in. You can do stuff like rate limiting, preventing abuse. If someone wants to experiment a little heavily and try to hit an API 10 times a second, that doesn't hurt your ERP system because it's stopped by the application, the API management. You can get analytics. Who's using our API? Which APIs are being used? Where are we consuming? What are we consuming? How much? How often? Is there any point to what all, all we do? Are we just going to die in the universe heat death eventually? You can implement caching on the edge. You can say, OK, this data it never updates, like once a year. I worked, in a, worked for a Norwegian oil company, and they had a service that was, they beefed up this service a little bit because everybody was hitting it all the time. OK, what does the service do? Well, it, it translates from field number to field name, like oil field. OK. How often does that change? Oh, never. Right. So let's implement some caching. So make sure that when people get that information, they never have to ask for it again. Oil field 22 will always be called foo. So let's take a look at a product to see how this actually looks, which is Azure API management which is a product, not a technique. <laughs> um, 
There are several ones out there. MuleSoft, I mentioned those. They make an API management tool. I'm showing off Azure API management because that's the one I've been using. That's the one I know. So an API management tool is not much fun without an API to manage. So the first thing you really want to do is import an existing API. You can start with something blank, which is kind of cool, because then you can say, say, I would like to have, ha to have an API that looks like this. And you can use tools in the API management to mock data, saying, if you call this, you should get something that looks like this. Here's a sample of data. So you can create your API with fake data before you even have a backend service, and then create a prototype client and say, well, if we had an API, and if we had a client, then it could have looked like this. And then people go, oh, I want that. Well, can you pay for it? Yes, I will. Excellent. <laughs> I have four people <laughs> waiting to program for you. <laughs> but let's try to connect to, it has some pre-built connections, connections to Azure services, but let's try to, to connect to an open API service. And it's pretty easy. You get this little form here. And the only important thing is the one on top here saying, where's your open API file? You give it the file, it will look at it, and it will find all the endpoints, all the operations, all the returns, everything, and it will just create whatever it needs to do to consume that. The rest is basically just naming. And then you get all of this here. And here all are some of the endpoints or methods that can be called in that particular API. And hopefully they're supported by the backend as well, since the backend just told us that we have this. Now, we can do a lot in that tool. We can change requests. We can manipulate requests. We can make different levels of service. Different APIs are in API managed, many other tools combined into what's called a product. And you can have developers or clients subscribing to products. And you can have different levels of products and you can say, do stuff like if you have this product, then you only get this data. And if you have this premium product or this other product or have permissions to this product, then you can get more data and so on and so forth. There's lots of things you can do with configuration. I'm not going to go into detail on Azure API management. It's not the point of this talk. And you can have a whole talk just on that. The point is, the API management tool will allow you to do a lot of things with configuration and will give you a bunch of services and features for free. That's why you want to use one. It will make your life easier. One of the things that is usually included in an API management tool is a developer portal. This is the out-of-the-box developer portal with Azure API management. It is completely configurable. It doesn't have to look like this. But to be honest, I couldn't be bothered to configure it just for this talk. <laughs> what you can do in the portal, as an administrator, you define your APIs, you define, add them into products. Users can sign in or sign up. Depending, if you want to leave it open for everyone, you can do that. If you want to secure it through your Azure AD, you can do that. If you want to include partners into your Azure AD, you can do that. Users can be approved, they can be locked down, whatever. But the people you allow to sign in can then subscribe to products and APIs. And here they can go in and see the API, similar to what we saw in the portal, in the admin portal. They can see the documentation for the API. All of this is coming from the open API file. The actual text doesn't really matter, so that's why it's not big. The point is that you can see what is it, what does the request look, what are the parameters, what are the responses. It has, like one would expect, if you click the green Try Here button, you get a little pop-out where you can add data and send it to the API and get the response back like we're used to doing with modern API documentations these days. And it is self-service. 
If you allow someone to sign up and you give them access to products, they can go in, they can generate their own keys. It's not for you to do anything with. And it goes back to the autonomous teams. They'll go, oh, we need access to this data, right? Go in the portal. There's that data. I want to subscribe to that package. If they are allowed to subscribe to it, it is automatically approved. You can have packages that need an approval step. But if everything is, is kosher, then they'll just run through it. And two minutes later, they can start ingesting data. And then you have this unified surface to our enterprise. And this too, the API manager, has an open API specification externally. So if you're making a client, if it's a mobile client, web client, JavaScript client, whatever, you can generate the client code you need and consume it, get up and running by cons with consuming this really, really quickly. Now, don't forget that you can and you definitely should put your own backend services into the API gateway. If you're making a service that does something completely different, is not part of this, it should also be exposed here. It can remove some of the work for you, rate limiting, authentication, caching, but you can also make your data and your stuff available to the rest of the company. Now, we've been talking a little bit about data, but we haven't talked about who owns it. And that is an important part of this enterprise. Who owns what? Who owns a particular piece of data? And not just who owns the customer, because we have customer in multiple places and they both have a claim to a customer. You need to define who owns the email address of the customer? Who owns the registration date for a customer? That's something you need to discover. You don't have to discover everything at once. If you talk to consultant companies, they will try to sell you a three month workshop with master data management to figure out where all the data on your company is. And they'll literally bring, bring you an elephant and make you eat it. But we're interested in slices, vertical slices. We want to work in vertical slices all the time. So we're interested in the customer. Okay, what customer data do we have? Who owns what? Because you know there's often between these systems, there's jobs replicating data. We have some putting in here. That needs to come over here. Just trace it back. Okay, this data originates here. The CRM system owns that piece of that customer. If you don't know where the source of that information is, how can you really trust giving it to your, the rest of your company, right? So you want to go back and find the source because I'm going to give this to everyone that asked for it. So you want to make sure that's correct. And also the other part, if you're putting data in, you really need to know where it goes. And that's the second part of it, master data management. I have my customer, I want to do an update from some guy. My sales person is out in the field and my customer has a new contact person, right? He'll go in, type in the, the salesperson will go in and type in the name and the email and the phone number of the new customer contact person. Where does that go? Well, it goes to the customer service, but where does that put it? Well, we have more or less two options. So the easy option is that the customer service already has a bit of knowledge about what comes from where. So it's not a huge leap to let the customer service figure out what goes where as well. The developers working on the customer service and the analysts working on the customer service probably have a fair idea of what goes where. So we can say, okay, this part goes here, and this part goes here. Take an update in and update the two different systems independently. Now, the problem here is that it creates a couple of hard couplings 
And it might make things more difficult in the end, and it makes the customer service slightly more complex. The other option is decoupling the customer service from updating downwards and making that more or less a read-only system. And then the updates that come in would be passed on as a message into some eventing system or a message bus in your corporation. Now, our two backend services, the ERP customer and the CRM customer services, they, they're subscribing to customer updates. They have said to the message bus saying, if you ever get an update from a customer, I want to know. Tell me. And so it does. The decoupling here is nice because this communication is asynchronous. In the case where the customer needs to update everything all the way to the back, if one of the backend system, one of the links in the chain is not working, then the data cannot be updated. And you have what's also known as a distributed transaction, which is a hard problem. Events can be easier to reason with the, about these things. But again, your mileage may vary. Which version you want will depend a little bit on what you're comfortable with. It will depend on how much logic is involved in shipping things from place to place. Other advantages, you can ship events off to somewhere else. Maybe some other thing is interesting in, in customer updates. And you can do away with updates between systems in a large degrees and rely on events. You can have these services here also emit events when things have changed from below, which could be handy. Now, I'm not going to talk about how to build an eventing system in the last five minutes, because that's slightly out of scope. But if you're interested in that, you can find me later on today. I'm more than happy to talk about eventing. <laughs> so where do you start? Well, start writing open API for your APIs today. If you're writing an, writing an API, you're doing yourself a disfavor if you're not generating any open API files. That will make your life easier right away, just for consumption directly. And it will make it a lot easier to integrate it later. If you're not using it for anything else, if, you make, if you're talking to a backend system today, then just put a proxy in front of it right away. Even if that's the only client you're consuming that from right now, because you know there's going to be one more, and another, and another. The worst part is when you consume an API or a backend system once directly, and it turns out that was so hard and so painful that we're never going to do that again. Or at least you're not going to do it unless you have a really good business case and a good return on investment. But if you make a little of an investment now, instead of you're making it anyway, just make a little split and put an open API on that. And then you have something that is easily consumable and reusable. Start with what you need. Don't wait for six months building something and put it on the shelf in your warehouse. Go down every Friday and look at your stuff. All of these APIs just waiting to be used. It's going to be so great. Just open up the API management and look at all the APIs. Every now and again, you check the analytics. Nobody's using them yet. They'll see the light. I built it, they will surely come. Quick poll, who has seen that movie? If you build it, they will come. Where that quote is from? Yeah, that's what I thought. It's an increasingly useless reference. <laughs> Do a proof of concept with a cloud managed API gateway. It is dead cheap. There's literally free developer tiers around, or if they're not free, they're super, super cheap. See what goes on. 
how this works, get a little feel for it, do a little collaboration, do an exploration, see what happens. And master data management is important. You need, when you start doing this, you need to have some concept of what data comes from where and what data should go where. That's what I had. Any questions? Oh, you just want to clap and go home. Okay, great. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Uh, it's a Kevin Costner movie, Field of Dreams where he's told by some spirits to build a baseball court in his back, in the back of his farm. See, she's seen it, she didn't know the reference. <laughs> the answer is probably it depends, but yes. So, yeah, um, so the question is, how do we, so we can expose all the data, but how do we actually use it for something useful? Um, is there any tools for managing the process of shifting this data around and going back and forth? Well, there's, there's two answers to that question. First of all, don't create data you don't need, which is the one part, start building something you actually need. Don't build DTOs and put them on the, where, on the shelf. So you start with a customer need, whether the customer is an internal customer, a stone customer, guess where you start. So we need these things. Okay, great, we'll build that. And it gets more complex, and then you have, well, if this comes in, and this, I need to tell this one and this one, and Logic Apps is actually a pretty good tool for that. If you're not under huge load, which you're often not in internal systems, then Logic Apps can be a really useful tool for generating these things that this goes here and this goes there. Um, some of the API platforms like MuleSoft have really good integration engines that will let you map out this goes here and then split this data and this goes here. And anyone who has the scars to have worked with BizTalk knows the, uh, some of that can work well and sometimes it won't. Um, my preference has been to start with actual needs and then build slices of that and try to generalize a little bit. But sometimes it makes sense to split the little pieces here and there. And it all comes down to, it depends <laughs> on that particular situation. I don't know if that helped. <laughs> Anyone else? OK, that's it. If you want to grab hold of me, I'll be waiting outside afterwards. And uh, I'll be around. Thank you.